Hi, this is Privateer Station, and since we started the topic of weapons supplies to Ukraine, let's dig deeper. Today we'll bring you an interview with uh, Yulia Latina and Mark Fagan, representing another consideration, another side if you want, another angle at the current raid and uh, assortment of uh, weapons supplies to Ukraine from the Allies. We'll continue looking deeper in the weeks to come. There are several other analysts with different opinions, but... Uh, but here is Yulia and Mark. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagin Live. It is Tuesday, November 15th, and it's 10 p.m. Oh, sorry, 8 p.m. in Kyiv. And we're doing another stream. We called it Arms for Ukraine. And we'll start talking about everything related to that question. We invited Yulia Latina. Glad to see you here, Yulia. I was looking in the chat here, I was called the biggest military expert among the philologists. I joined that opinion. Yes, I'm of the same opinion. It doesn't matter, Yulia, you're pretty good as, uh, at digging at things and uh, unearthing different facts. We're trying to analyze a lot of aspects and there are a lot of different materials coming together at one point. Not too many people are digging deep into that topic, and today, actually, the actuality of this one was always sharp since the beginning of this war. There is a lot of uh, argument between land lease, and uh, it's worth looking into. And today we saw another reaction of Moscow. Was it uh, the result of G20, or maybe another cyclical madness? They dropped another 90 missiles at the territory of Ukraine, over 70 were shot down, reportedly, and uh, Ukraine continues to analyze consequences to its energy supply system, and the question rises again that Ukraine needs uh, certain armaments to establish parity in defending their country, that not just the attacking ones, but also defending ones, and also the ones that would um, create a certain threat to Russia, because Shoigu's uh, villa will never be shot at with the current arms, so he is not worrying about his own home. Um, while if Ukraine had that, that would probably cause a pause to Russian uh, leadership. Anyway, we wanted to look at all that and uh, ask you for some explanation or analysis from your point of view. Are they enough? Do they need to increase to conclude that uh, whole ordeal, especially now after Kherson? So my first question is, can we make a conclusion that during these eight and a half months, the weapons that were supplied to Ukraine is decisively enough to provide exactly that result? With the occupation of part of Kherson region, Kiev, Chernigov, Sumy, of course, uh, the north, and the right bank of uh, Dnieper. Or could there be done more? Is it not enough? Let's put the question this way. So, first of all, about the air defense, Americans have uh, 40,000 hawks on their warehouses, it's a precursor to Patriot system, and uh, nobody needs it, it's in the warehouse. When I was asking questions, why can it not be supplied, one of the military experts, Pavel Luzin, mentioned that perhaps not all of them are in good condition, since if it is uh, in the warehouse, even if it's American warehouse, something could have been uh, running out of warranty, running out of uh, dates. It's not AK, right? But uh, you understand that it would not likely touch uh, all 40,000 of them. So, and that's not even uh, an active service with the US military. It's an old one, but we can see that they also supplying harm missiles, anti-radio location systems, which are pretty old. Like my old friend Roman Svetan says, it's a grandma that's designed to shoot down the grandpa, the S-300. And we can see that it hits pretty well the grandpa, the son of that grandpa, and the grandchild of that grandpa, S-400, which is basically a repainted S-300. So, and in regards to Kherson operation, we can say that if Ukrainians had F-16s and tanks, 
during Kherson operation, then the result of that operation would have been very different. And there would not be a retreat of Russian troops. There would have been encirclement or destruction of them. Because one of the main things that is not being given to Ukraine yet is uh, offensive, heavy armaments for offensive operations. So, also, let's kind of take a broader perspective look, so we don't keep touching the foot of an elephant and telling everybody that the elephant has the shape of a column. Looking at the overall support of arms, we can say that allies and the United States have their goal at uh, affecting the outcome of this uh, conflict? Do they want to not let Russia lose or do they want to eliminate the aggressor uh, capability to attack and liberate ever, help Ukraine liberate the territory? So let's dig deeper into that and try to be honest. Also, do you know what is presidential drawdown authority, Mark? No, I don't know. Can you tell us more? I'm just putting here it as a bookmark. We'll get back to that later. Uh, very peculiar capability. Um, we knew that the United States were aware of Russian imminent attack. Uh, the director of CIA uh, later leaked that he was told by President Putin that that is exactly what they're going to do. So they were not really supplying Ukraine anything before this operation. There were some javelins supplied by previous administration, but again, it's a beautiful weapon, but it only goes as far as five miles, and uh, this is just not enough. Artillery is a main argument in the modern-day war. Our field artillery even reaches 15-20 miles, and uh, in order to get to anybody with javelin, you need to cross that distance. So, looking at that, at the beginning of war, United States probably did not believe that Ukraine can successfully defend themselves. And when General was saying that their that behavior could uh, provoke Putin, uh, he probably is right. There is another story, but I don't know how many people know of it, but since 2014, United States were giving radars for the counter-battery fire, but they were providing them with a turned-off function of uh, hitting back. So these raiders, uh, they saw who was shooting what from where, but you, they, they could not be used to counterattack to attack the attacker. So we have a very detailed documentation of what was going on in Donbas, but uh, Ukrainians could not respond. And uh, Ukraine had a very difficult situation at the beginning of this war. What Aristovich mentioned in spring, Ukraine pretty much ran out of ammo for their artillery. They had mortars, they had 122 millimeters, but they had no ammo for 150 millimeter cannons. Uh, artillery and Russia was dumping tens of thousands of shells from their side onto the trenches and it was uh, just leveling everybody there. I talked personally to a big tough guy from those trenches who actually ended up uh, with a concussion in uh, with a contusion in the hospital and he was nearly crying on the, the phone with me. He was telling, we had some javelins, we ran out of them, we were out of RPGs, we had no ammo for artillery, and at the end Wagner troops came over and just kicked us out. So he was, yeah, the, the day was, that period was pretty rough for him. As they say, the milk got spoiled and the candle fell, um, as an old saying goes. But uh, when I called him a few weeks later, he was shining as a young boy who got new toys. Uh, they got uh, M777, the three axis howitzer, 150 mil 55 millimeter. And he was just delighted how effective, how accurate, how uh, good are these uh, howitzers. And that was the time when the battle for uh, Severodonetsk was starting. And during that fight, that's what was going on. For example, Ukrainian troops would be sitting in the house. Russian uh, cannon fodder is being so sent out forward. There's usually some contractors or 
uh, more experienced DNR fighters in the back and some newbies walking in front. Ukrainians would shoot, start shooting at them. After that, Russian tank comes out, looks from behind the corner, which is difficult to reach even with Javelin, and carefully shoots right at the position of the Ukrainian troops in the house, after which it collapses. Unless they manage to run away, they're all dead. After 777 arrived, the, everything was going in the same format, except there was a, a copter hovering above the tank, and when the tank would be approaching the situation to shoot at Ukrainians, uh, 777 would shoot up the tank, and the tank is gone. So that all turned into the operation Wet Sugar, as I like to call it from Roman Svetan Easy Pitch, Basically, Russia would, was gas, gathering all troops, all resources they could from other parts of the front to continue attack on Severodonetsk, and uh, they lost a lot of equipment and a lot of people. And later, the HIMARS also entered the fray, but uh, that's where the situation from strategically defeating for strategic defeat for Ukraine into a strategic victory for Ukraine. And uh, it's understandable that uh, Ukraine is being supplied defensive weapons mostly by United States because it's more effective to grind enemy's troops in defense mode. And remember the letter mentioned in the Hill um, when 20 people from the left and right, from Ben Hodges to Marie Ivanovich, who is a opponent of Trump, to uh, Trump's representative in NATO, to other generals, all of them signed a letter demanding uh, or asking to supply weapons to Ukraine until it is too late. And I'm quoting Michael Podolak here, if the United States increased the amount of weapons they're supplying to Ukraine and also gave attackments and uh, some armor and tanks and F-16, then uh, the war would be over in about two to three months. And as I mentioned, Russian troops would not have left Kherson. So these things are important to consider when you consider when you are looking into the military help because numbers is a peculiar thing. There is lies, blatant lies, and statistics. Numbers can always be polished to look one way or another. So, what do you want to see? Look more in the battlefront or look in the numbers? Let's look at the numbers first and then switch to the battlefront. Okay. So, I will say up front that the exact numbers of military aid to Ukraine differ. It is difficult to calculate how this uh, these monies travel from one budget to another and where they uh, surface and when they dive and disappear. But I'm quoting CNBC and some other resources who calculated that Ukraine got uh, armaments worth of $15.2 billion from United States, just weapons. Then there is a Stinson Center that calculated $17.6 billion in the same period. And then there is also British House of Commons library source, usually a very good reliable source that says uh, over eight months Ukraine got uh, armaments worth of 18.6 billion. And also there is a Kiev Institute of International Economy that calculates uh, designated aid to Ukraine, that not necessarily it had arrived, it just what was designated. And uh, they calculated that at $25 billion. And um, we're talking only about military armaments, we're not talking about monetary and other humanitarian supplies. So what do you think, Mark, is it enough or not? It depends, depends what you're comparing with. Exactly. So when people start dropping numbers on you, so, even in the Bible sources, uh, they have issues comparing one thing with another. When they say this is a fraction and it's not even a tenth, uh, it's incomparable. Anyway, so let's go back and compare with other things. From 2001 to 2021, Americans spent $82.9 billion for the Afghanistan campaign. The real amount of uh, 
money that Afghanistan received was 79 billion and and 18 billions, about 29 percent, were exclusively for military armaments or its transportation. And I was looking at what was supplied to Afghanis. Again, that was American army fighting there as well, but uh, this is what was supplied to Afghanis during that time. It's tears. They had 250,000 rifles and machine guns, 126,000 pistols, 42,000 vehicles, 22 Humvees, 16,000 night vision goggles. They never got any Heimers, any 777s. Maximum what they received was 2,600 mortars. 60 and 80 millimeter and 122 millimeter howitzers and also they got 189 armored vehicles and eight drones sky eagle the ones that pentagon refuses to supply to ukraine right now or citing that uh, or claiming that if it gets into russian hands they can reverse engineer so very often what they claim is that uh, they don't supply certain things or when this thing gets into the Russian hands or into the opponent's hands they can reverse engineer that so Americans always consider reverse engineering as a threat when they're bringing weapons but uh, by the way Afghanis did get some air support they got some airplanes 16 transport 18 Intel and uh, they got A20. And I was wondering how did uh, Afghani's army got airplanes and Ukrainians are not getting one. I was looking at what did they get and what is that A20. This is a prop. This is a turboprop light a sold plane it's basically a very old one very old kind very often america supports supplies uh, armaments produced in different countries so this uh, plane was a brazilian made by embraer top speed was 590 kilometers an hour its specifications state that basically it's an airplane to hunt the drug traffickers by default they consider there is no books or no air defense not even a stinger on the ground because that plane would not be able to withstand any of that 590 kilometers an hour that's basically second world war speeds and of course we understand probably it's uh, useless to supply HIMARS to Afghanistan first of all there are no targets for HIMARS why were not HIMARS supplied to Afghanistan what are the warehouses that it would be shooting at same thing as that uh, old turboprop is useless to be supplied to Ukraine so what I'm approaching that is that in counter to the popular legend it is incomparable with Afghanistan war because Afghanistan got about 18 billion dollars worth in 20 years and Ukraine got about the same amount of armaments worth in uh, eight months so if you read deeper into what was supplied to Afghanis, uh, it seems mostly that, uh, especially from WikiLeaks and other uh, materials that reports by Americans and their allies that they didn't really trust Afghanistan army. They were complaining that they trade drugs, they have uh, boys' harems, they behave themselves as bandits, as gangsters. So same as uh, Wagner troops sort of uh, on the Ukrainian front. So I understand the American line of thinking. If we supply howitzers to them, pretty good thing in uh, your household, right? And then in the morning we'll read something in the news that how it's that howitzer was used to shell some village uh, to duke it out with a warring family. So they were not supplying those uh, weapons to Afghanistan. There is a definitely different attitude to Ukrainian army. 
there is a risk that maybe things will fall into hands of Russian side and it'll be reverse engineered, but uh, there's uh, definitely no that issue of trust of giving these weapons to Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is getting five times more armaments during this war than Israel, the main uh, ally of the United States in the Middle East. Well, different comparison, but still. And it's more than United States supplied to all countries of the world taken together last year. Um, another aspect, remember there was a historic land lease, what United States were supplying in 1940s to Britain, to USSR. There were a gigantic number of countries that they supplied, including China. It was about $50 billion in those prices, about $700 billion in today's prices. And let's take USSR. USSR got roughly about $11 billion from that amount. That's about $25 billion a year. So the volume of military aid that Ukraine got in eight months can generally be compared with the amount of aid that Soviet Union was getting during the Second World War, which had a certain population, a certain length of front. And what's important is probably how are these monies being given. There is a lot of conversation about land lease, right? So, first of all, you need an approval of Congress to give money to a certain cause. It's democracy, right? It's the foundation. Congress needs to approve that. Apologies for a small detour, but I don't know if our viewers know why Britain lost a hundred years war. They've been winning every single battle on the front, but guess mark, why did they lose the whole war? I don't know, I'm not competing in that uh, quiz. I almost gave you an answer. The thing is that English Parliament, every time when the king was going to fight overseas, uh, over the over the strait, uh, Parliament was asking, what money? What money are you going to spend on that? So eventually they basically stifled that war with uh, monetary, with fiscal policy. So in America, there is a democracy that needs to confirm that this money needs to go there. So that's how Ukraine Appropriation Supplemental Act appeared on the 10th of March this year uh, for $3.5 billion. But of course, American government, as uh, any big government bureaucracy, has a ton of different programs that can be shuffled here and there and other things that can be used for the same purpose. I'm quoting the same source, Ukrainian Institute. Another program, Ukraine got 650 million from Department of State, about 100 million uh, dollars. Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, about 300 million from Department of Defense. And this is the Kiev Institute of World Economy calculating military supplies. We're not talking about somebody getting money to pay for some other direct purchase. So, together with this act, it gets totaled to about $4.35 billion by April. Then there is also that famous uh, mentioned land lease. This is uh, an interesting mechanism that appeared when U.S. bureaucracy was uh, somewhat at its infancy and Roosevelt cannot be called authoritarian a dictator, of course, but he uh, was doing a lot of different things under his reign. There were editors of newspapers who were not in favor of Roosevelt, uh, put in jail, of course, for not paying taxes. Uh, radio stations were... some licenses were revoked, of course, for some other violations and taxes, just, you know, nothing personal. And um, then, they, that's how, in, in that administration, there was an interesting law that came about when they were not uh, granting weapons to allies because they had no money to pay for that. Probably Britain was a, diff a little different because US got a lot of patents back in return, but it was landed or leased. And then it was supposed to be returned, all the armaments were supposed to be returned after war if they survive. 
So one of uh, people in US also also described that law as something as a chewing gum that you lend to somebody and then ask to return it back after it was chewed. A very descriptive picture of that program. So United States decided again to insure itself a little bit and uh, they took they adopted lend lease uh, law to be able to supply weapons to Ukraine, even if the opponents of uh, supporting Ukraine would have won in different elections that year. I'm not pointing fingers, I'm not saying Democrats or Republicans, because there are people supporting or opposing aid to Ukraine on both sides. So imagine uh, the, the, main, the main premise of that uh, lend lease program is that if uh, Congress becomes hostile to support of Ukraine, lend lease program could have been used to uh, bypass Congress and still support Ukraine. And it's not being actually used much. And another thing that almost nobody talks about, as I said, lend lease law is actually a way to ride around the Congress on uh, a goat that kind of circumvent if they don't want to support. And as, as I said, Roosevelt is an interesting persona who is uh, liked in America, but his practices are not so much uh, repeated, including 98% taxes and price regulations and other things. So since then, American bureaucracy also is not a fledgling anymore. They, uh, they have more authority, they have a longer lifespan and more experience. And then there is a, a special act, a presidential drawdown act, which also was amended. The last amendment was made in during Trump administration, foreign assistance aid. There is a paragraph 218. So it says that if president discovers something that happened overseas, then according to the paragraph 2411, if things cannot be stopped according to paragraph 2651, the president can take anything from the warehouse of Minister of Defense and transfer it to the locale where the disaster or difficult situation is unfolding. At first, the, there was a note in that law that uh, overall amount of things being transferred should not exceed $100 million. So it kind of made sense, right? Uh, $100 million, so you don't overspend, but if you need something urgently, you can do that. So what does Department of State and uh, bureaucracy do? When in spring they adopted, they agreed to $3.5 billion, remember? So all these paragraphs that I mentioned, 2,500 and something, that, that all was called together presidential drawdown authority. Basically a president to reach the pocket and give out the money or the equipment. And in this act, all these 3.5 billion worth of weapons are being sent to Ukraine due to presidential drawdown authority. So you did not need to affirm anything through Congress. President could get up and say, I'm sending that much to Ukraine. And part of that money was, of course, something that was designated for Ukraine earlier. Something that was given to Ukraine in uh, on the 21st of December and uh, early in February. That was all given to Ukraine, all the javelins and small things. That was also part of that supply. Then on the 12th of March, 200 millions, 800 millions by the end of month, and then every two weeks, 800 millions, 800 millions, and by the 9th of May, they concluded that with the last 100 million dollars. So in that period, that's how 3.5 billions were sent to Ukraine. 3.5 billions were over, were done with. Then there is additional Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations Act being introduced. And that one 
already for 33 billions. And while running through the halls of Congress, it grew to about 40 billions. Not everything was dedicated for exact military supplies. Military was only totaling 25 billion, out of which only 10 were designated to Ukraine. So out of 40, only 10.1 billion worth were designated for Ukraine. Also in this act, there was another thing written out. Besides this 10 billion that were approved by Congress, President, using that same drawdown authority, just like in that old joke, where do you get money from? From the shelf. How do they appear on the shelf? Oh, my wife puts them there. So President can go into the drawer and give additional $11 billion worth of armaments just for fiscal year 22. And uh, as of 28th of October, US administration reached into that pocket 11 times. Last time I think it was the 12th time. So that is, in my opinion, a very interesting story. What can you say about it, Mark? It's impressive. It's impressive and I have a question related to that. Can we say that this that looks a very complicated scheme because of all the regulative moments that executive power has in the United States? Did United States affect the situation on the front? by pushing these uh, armaments, did that uh, exact help? Did the financing aspect of it help with supplies of armaments? Did it have any projection on the front? I think to answer that question, we should look deeper into what was going on the front. And I would save it for the end, probably, because it is a very important moment. I think it is the most important thing we can discuss this hour, because when people talk about numbers, you can manipulate numbers, you can confuse people with them pretty quickly. But let's switch to the front. At the end, because in this regard, it's uh, kind of useless to ask where is land lease. It's an old mechanism. That is a, a fail-safe if everything else is not working. So it was never used, right? No, it was never used. There is a lot of discussion around it. Where is land lease? So they were using other instruments, right? They were using other instruments, alternative, not just alternative, but actually better instruments, one can argue. As long as they have majority in Congress uh, eager to support aid to Ukraine, as long as they are okay with supporting uh, that and draw down authority that is a special creature. Uh, bureaucrats during Roosevelt times could not do that. So it's kind of a very high level of bureaucracy where they take a, an act of, let's say, president can catch that many butterflies for that amount of money. Then they changed butterflies for boxes and changed the number of money. And at the end, they has uh, 11 billion of dollars that president can take out of that pocket and reallocate to certain goals plus 11 billions that Congress approved for military aid. All these uh, pathways, all these uh, ways to perform that function, this is not exactly a warehouse with weapons. This is just, these are just ways of how to supply that. You can supply that by Route A or by Route B. And it's pointless to ask why is not our armaments going through Route B, because we want it to Route B. Uh, it doesn't make sense. But the better question to ask is why you're not supplying Hawks, why not supplying tanks? Don't ask about the route. It is not that important. It is not, uh, Lend Lease is not a train with goodies that is standing somewhere in the back waiting to be supplied. It is just a manner of uh, a legal and logistical manner of how it will be supplied. And since we have a bit of time, let's briefly remind people what was happening on the front. As I said, you can confuse people with numbers. It's much harder to confuse people when you are describing events attached to these numbers. 
прошла Украина в первые месяцы войны. So... If one can name a system that saved more Ukrainian lives during the first months of war, I would remember uh, Krapiva system. This is a software that united civilian drones and civilian tablets into a single system of targeting and control, fire control for the artillery. And that allowed an outdated even Soviet artillery to shoot about five times more effective than it would otherwise. So Russian military were using the same artillery just uh, to cover large, large uh, sluice of land and create a firewall. And Ukrainian were using the same artillery to target more with much higher precision. So that, at that point in February, March, was uh, that wonder weapon, wonder weapon for Ukraine that can only be created in uh, the army where the volunteers work, where volunteers fight, because operators of these drones are the ones who were shooting uh, weddings and aerial uh, photography just months before that war. So they were the ones who knew how to operate that. And then later, howitzers appeared. The 777, they have about 170 of them on the front. And we see from the beginning a digital fire control system. So this, of course, also changes the fight, the character of the fight for Severodonetsk, as I said. And second thing that happens is the United States starts supplying first HIMARS systems, which can carry missiles, different types of missiles, different types of ammunition. We'll talk about items that they don't have, but uh, Jim Lares that Ukraine got can reach up to 92 kilometers. They fly according to GPS coordinates and the input of HIMARS in that stage of war after Severodonetsk uh, M777 input and in general 150 millimeter artillery. This was another game changer because HIMARS shells started to take out Russian warehouses 70 kilometers, 60 kilometers away from the front that collapsed the whole logistics uh, chains of Russian army because most of it was relying on the firewall created by artillery, just uh, carry every, take everything out and then advance on the torn positions. So firewall was no more. HIMARS destroyed supply lines and warehouses Transportation shoulder grew exponentially. Army started to bring shells from 80 kilometers. They were using grain transport very often to uh, mask somehow. They were warehoused in smaller warehouses. So Hammers took out the big ones, then took out the middle ones, then started taking out individual ones. Then they started making little shelters in the field, in the forest. And now, very often, they just drop it from a vehicle that delivered a portion of ammo to a small little uh, truck, and the truck takes it to the last uh, step. So that's why, they, by the way, they gave up Kherson region, because there was no way to supply their army on that side of the river, because Hammers were taking out any organized attempt to deliver additional shells, additional ammo to Russian artillery. So this is an ode to HIMARS, for example, Kherson, that's definite ode to HIMARS. So several things about it. It travels at a speed of our usual truck along the rocade road, parallel road to the front. You can transport it and be very effective. In Syria, there is no, there are no roads, so it's very difficult to use it there. Second, HIMARS is attacking what? HIMARS' juicy target are warehouses, right? So it needs to be taken out to preclude the firewall happening. Uh, ISIS and Syria, they were not really stockpiling things anywhere, so HIMARS were not effective there, and they were not, were not used widely. Um, why Russia doesn't have anything like HIMARS? Well, GPS system matters. Uh, Russia has Tornado with a similar capabilities that can use uh, some of the targeting, but they don't have enough uh, satellites to coordinate, to target it well. So HIMARS also is relying on that AI networks and additional satellites that provide all data so they can calculate targeting way more with higher precision.
And Russia has probably two military satellites that uh, provide them some data, but that's not enough what they have and their capability is nowhere near to be precise. So another peculiar moment is that most of these satellites that are supplying data for HIMARS are commercial satellites. Maxars and others, they essentially, it's a commercial system competing with the authoritarian system. So commercial is more reliable, more saturated, of higher quality than Russian military satellite system. So again, HIMARS is a good vehicle for defense. It is not uh, that effective uh, in offensive operations. It is more effective in defensive operations. And uh, that was a great tool to aid Ukrainians to grind down the Russian troops. And every attempt of Russians to attack them ever since uh, was faced with uh, artillery and HIMARS uh, counterfire and uh, pretty much failed. As people are chatting here in the chat, yeah, I'm telling you that as a philologist, exactly. Um, another weapon that we can talk about is HARM missiles. This is an old grandma that was designed to shoot down older missiles and instead of uh, just targeting older ones, it, the Ukrainians used to clean radio electronic equipment, any of that uh, that Russia brought. So basically anything that was uh, radiating any emissions, any radio location signal on the territory of Ukraine, on the front line, Ukraine took them all out with harm missiles. Remember, in Belgorod there were some booms, there were some other things happening. There was always a harm flying first into the radar to blind Russian troops, and then and then they destroyed Russian uh, SAM side or artillery side. Or... So when harms destroyed air defense on the right bank of uh, Dnepr and Kherson, that was another stone into the grave of them retreating from that area. There was just uh, a couple planes flying with harms initially destroying Russian radio location stuff. And uh, eventually when they took everything out, now they can fly with more jets there much actively, much more actively. And Ukrainians, they do repeat the mantra that, uh, and Alexei Rostovich repeats that often, that uh, supplies are going according to the plan and they are not uh, often reflect the situation on the front. I'm not sure about that point because when I discussed that with Roman Svetan and some others, uh, right before liberation of Kherson, Ukraine got a bunch of uh, Phoenix Ghost, uh, basically flying uh, ammo, uh, a drone that uh, can hover above and then attack a target. So if Russian troops were, would not have withdrawn from Kherson, uh, Ukrainian soldiers could still sit in the trenches and operate these things and take out Russian tanks defending that area. So. Right before these Phoenix uh, systems were supplied, they got 10,000 troops, best of the best, returned back from training in NATO countries that were trained how to use that via weapons. And it was an interesting story with the barraging ammo, with that uh, drone ammo, basically. It doesn't have a big uh, capacity to take big things out. But remember, switchblades, when they were supplied, there was a lot of uh, noise about uh, how wonderfully it'll take out Russian equipment, uh, somehow it didn't uh, follow through. Some people were saying radio electronic measures uh, stopped it. Others were saying that perhaps people who were using that, and that's my feeling, maybe people who were using that weren't too effective in the use of that weapon. And remember that uh, sandbar near uh, near Kherson, where the Ukrainian troops took out Russians uh, across from the city. Um, right before that operation, Ukraine got several battle jets, jet boats. So um, it appears that there are some things that are being supplied very tactically. And uh, we can see that some things that uh, the nomenclature is expanding, but there are some things that are not being supplied yet. And as Ukraine said, that would allow to finish war, to conclude this war in three to four months. What is not being supplied? First of all, Ukraine is claiming not enough artillery. On Bakhmut direction, Russia still has overwhelming advantage, one to seven. 
Of course, precision of fire is a different factor, but it's difficult to fight uh, against other artil uh, artillery when you've just won and there are seven other batteries against you. So, Ukraine got M31, M30, so M31, that's the one they use against the warehouses, M30 is the one that explodes above the ground and shells everything with uh, small metal balls. Then they have uh, another version of a uh, missile of ammo for HIMARS that uh, flies about 20-something miles. And uh, it's not guided, it's with lesser precision, but it's also pretty effective. And it's being used pretty effectively. When Kharkov, they started, uh, remember the Russians started fleeing in Kharkov? That started with HIMARS that came there and started shelling a certain part of the front. And when uh, the troops started retreating, uh, that's where the Ukrainians broke through. But we still don't see Atakams on the front, and of course it reaches out to 300 miles. But there are some rumors that uh, Ukraine might get extended range GMLRS with a range of 150 kilometers. Biden mentioned that uh, in passing, and I quoted a letter one of, from one of the Ukrainians in uh, United States who was present at the head of the Intel Committee in Senate uh, meeting and uh, he did mention as well that that uh, missile, that, that ammo was mentioned. And I looked at the news as we were holding this stream, there were two missiles that fell in Poland, the chat is exploding now, they did fall, they killed the, reportedly two people, even in Kremlin, it is reported, and Poland is confirming that. We'll talk about that separately, that's a whole other topic later, in about an hour with Alexei, and we'll discuss that matter in more details. I hope he will perhaps find out more details about that. And we can discuss it, because we're live, we're here doing the stream, we can't really react to things unfolding right now. We do not have the data and we don't want to provide wrong commentary, we want to stay on topic. So we've been live for about 46 minutes, we have a little bit of time. There are about 50,000 watching us, about 13,000 people click the like button. The question as follows. Given the escalation trend that is happening, just looking at recent news, if Ukraine gets uh, certain means further reaching perhaps uh, offensive uh, equipment, Atakams, jets, armored vehicles, what are the chances to expedite the occupation in your point of view, Yulia? So those ones that they lack, jets, let's say, F-15s. We, we just talked that it definitely will expedite how much radically it will expedite? A year or five months? You should ask Kristovich, but the Lex says three to four months. And I think Zdanov and Svitan, they do agree with them. Me, personally, I would rely on them. I would rely on their opinion. Since we have very little time left, I want to bring one very important thing out front. First, very briefly, why and what is not being supplied. We can bring a ton of technical things that Atakams, they violate a contract of uh, mid-range missile non-proliferation, or for tanks, especially for Abrams and F-16s, one needs a very strong technical support base. And if to deploy that in Ukraine, it's too long. If to use that in Poland, it means involving a NATO country directly into the conflict. So, I know the answer, I think, to only one question. When they're saying that they're supplying M... They're supplying M777, they have uh, a ton of howitzers, precursors to M777s. They have M198s on the warehouse, 
And I think I know the narrow, the bottleneck, why these ones are not supplied. It's probably the number of shells. I found an interesting number that right now United States are manufacturing 30,000 shells for these howitzers per year. That amount can fly in three days on this war. Of course, you can increase that capacity, and that's uh, what United States appear to be doing now. Very often, people are saying, you can take it from the warehouse, there is no deficit of weapons. This one is a little uh, blanketing statement. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Hawks, yeah, you can take that, I believe. And I believe as a new package, they started supplying them. But howitzers M198, it wouldn't make sense to give them because they would be using the same ammo, which is at a bottleneck. You could use a smaller caliber. You can take some smaller caliber howitzers from the artillery from the warehouses, and that would be an option. So, another question about tanks. First of all, with the offensive equipment, their Ukrainian requests are slowly but are being fulfilled. And on the other hand, Americans prefer to give defensive weapons. And another thing is that Ukraine is not passively waiting for these uh, weapons to arrive. Because when Ukraine is attacking a uh, bridge in Crimea, the warehouses in Crimea, uh, airport, airports and airfields with strategic airplanes that Russia has, even in the Russian territory, it just points out that uh, Putin is bluffing about his strategic nuclear systems and that he'll use them immediately if his territory is attacked. So, Ukraine was uh, pretty successful in attacking what they had. Um, Ukraine actually is kind of ready to use Abrams tanks. They used German uh, Jeopards recently to, uh, in one of their offensive maneuvers. They, it's a Zenith uh, air defense systems, but they pointed them down and they used them as uh, armored vehicles. So. When people are, uh, there is a popular statement that Americans are not giving enough, that they are um, somewhat uh, hesitating about supporting Ukraine. When you dive deeper into the monetary and the equipment uh, assortment that is being supplied to Ukraine, that kind of help was never provided to other country in recent history. This help is not being given for nothing. This help can only be given to another country to totally annihilate the opposing regime, the, the regime that started this war. I'm not even talking about President Biden or Deep State, I'm just saying in general. So what uh, did they do? They changed, when people are saying that United States want to sign peace treaty with Russia, you think that bureaucracy changed law and allowed President to draw $10 billion worth of uh, equipment? to do what? To sign peace treaty? In Ukraine, I think United States are actually making a statement and uh, fighting a, a sort of revenge war to pay back for Afghanistan, for Vietnam, for uh, Korea and other places. So they, I hope, finally see that they can win here. That since uh, Second World War, excluding Israel, there was not a single situation when the United States would be supporting a real democracy fighting communism or uh, Islam or something. They always supported some weird uh, political dictatorships or uh, authoritarian regimes and, and, and such. And the lefts and the rights of the world were always pointing to Americans, you can never bring democracy uh, with your guns. Look at what you, uh, you've done in Iraq. Look at what is in Afghanistan. I think this is a revenge. This is a final uh, counter argument to that. Finally, they are supporting a true democratic, true democracy. They are suppressing one of the worst dictators and uh, probably also sending a message to Erdogan and Xi Jinping, uh, to a, a bit more serious dictators, that when Putin started shaking his red button and saying nukes, nukes, he had lost in that conflict. He lost with his nuclear bluff because he was called on that. And 
I am telling you, please do not pay attention to the statements made by secretaries and even president. They talk. Many people talk. Look at what and how much is being supplied. How much money is being dedicated to the cause and what military resources are being supplied. This is a deep state sort of that actually dedicates these amounts and these weapons. This bureaucracy works the inner works of the big aircraft carrier and they don't really care about what is being screamed up on top, on the top level of that aircraft carrier. Yes, they're doing it with uh, maximum safety for themselves and maximum efficiency for themselves, not for Ukraine, because they also minimize chances for nuclear confrontation in the meantime. And yes, Ukrainians are paying that with their lives for that, for that speed. I think they also remember lessons from Iraqi campaign from 91, when there was immediate victory in Kuwait, but the United States decided not to bring troops into Iraq because they hoped that Saddam will topple after this failure. And they understand that uh, things need to change. So it's an old story about a frog, remember, if you drop a frog into the boiling water, it likely will jump out and save itself. But if you boil it slower, it will be boiled. So they, their goal, cynical as it is, it is important to save Ukrainian troops and not so much civilians. This is my personal conclusion that uh, I came to. And why did not they want to give tanks during the battle for Donbass? What if they give tanks and these Ukrainians take tanks and they manage to break through but will lose them to their army in the meantime? So I think that may be a strategy that is not being discussed in the open air in the modern world, but it still works. Having a, an army capable to defend uh, is important. And these are the questions that people keep bringing up. Where are the tanks? Where are the tanks? So they haven't got Abrams yet, but T-72s are being supplied in the last package, not American, of course, but uh, they were, they'll be refitted according to American standards. There are 90 of those. F-16s are not being supplied yet, but pilots are already tra trained. Uh, Atticums are not in the package yet, but 150 kilometers GMLRS is definitely on the table. So, if Ukrainians are screaming long enough about certain type of weapons, they eventually get it. It starts to drip, to trickle through, and to arrive on the front. All right, we've been live for about 57 minutes. 52,000 of you watched us live. Over 15,000 clicked the like button. And let's conclude that. Uh, in an hour, we'll be talking with Alexei Aristovich. And hopefully we'll be able to address that uh, missile crisis in Poland and what happened while we were streaming here. I thank you, Leo. Thank you a lot for such a deep dive and the tremendous amount of work you did. You probably replaced a lot of experts that we could have invited otherwise. Uh, this is a lot of work to bring it up and calculate and look into that. And share links to that stream. Uh, click the like button and subscribe to Fagin Live, to Yulia Latinina. It will be in the description to that video and, of course, to the privateer station. We're trying to bring that to you in English. Have a good day. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you, Mark. As it was said, best military expert from Flowgist. I'm trying. <laughs>